Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Today we're gonna to be looking at a video that I just saw vlogging through history, did a reaction to, which is World War I every day using Google Earth. I thought it would have been better if it was called World War I every day with army sizes because that's exactly the kind of video that it is. And probably the favorite video that I've ever done on this channel is still the World War II with army sizes where I basically get to talk about the entire conflict the video itself, I think, is 10 minutes, so the original video, and I managed to talk about it for 49 minutes. So I was quite proud that I managed to talk for two minutes more than Vlogging Through History, which is a great channel. Go check that out. Definitely serves as an inspiration for this one. Anyways, I wanted to have a look at this one. I have a lot less to say about World War I than I do with World War II. I know a lot more about World War II than with this conflict, and the front lines didn't move as much. Right off the bat, though, I do want to comment, though, that it's unfortunate that a lot of the fighting, for example, in Tanzania or modern Tanzania, we will not see, right? There was a ton of fighting during the First World War down in the Africa front. Um, one of Germany's most famous generals, I'm sorry, I don't remember his name off the top of my head right now. Um, he sort of participated in guerrilla warfare there and it was one of the first instances of modern guerrilla warfare um, that humanity has really seen. But either way, I don't know if he's gonna add text to the bottom here. I haven't started this more than like two seconds. So yeah, this will be interesting. And um, I don't know, it, it, it kind of sucks that that Google thing is right there, but hey, let's have a look. Let's go through it. Hope you enjoy. If you haven't already yet, please remember to like, comment, subscribe. Let's go. All right, boom, instant pause. So what happened here? So Austria-Hungary has declared war on Serbia. Fer Franz Ferdinand has been assassinated and Austria-Hungary sends Serbia, I believe it was 10 points to, to basically as an ultimatum to adhere to these 10 points or else it will be war. Serbia adheres to nine of them and one of them it outright rejects, giving Austria-Hungary the casus belli to invade Serbia. Now Austria-Hungary would not actually successfully invade Serbia, but that'll come a little bit later. And as you noticed, it was just Austria-Hungary and Serbia and then uh, Germany joins, Russia joins, France joins, and then the UK joins. So uh, Russia saw itself as the protector of Slavs in, um, in Europe. And so obviously they joined against Austria-Hungary since um, Serbia is a Slavic nation. Germany joins because they gave Austria-Hungary the blank check, which basically meant that any conflict that Austria-Hungary would get in, Germany would guarantee back them. France gets involved because of the... Um, I believe it was an alliance in the 1890s, I want to say. I talked about it in the World War I video um, in, um, for, for Epic History TV. I don't remember quite off the top of my head. And so they're in an alliance as well. And Britain will get involved because uh, Germany violates Belgian independence. They try to march through Belgium. They ask the Belgians, they say, we want to go through your country as per the Schlieffen Plan, which was a plan made by General Schlieffen, who died before it actually got to see it enacted, where the idea was is that instead of fighting along this heavily fortified um, region here, so Alsace-Lorraine, which, uh, which France would eventually reclaim from Germany, uh, but this region right here, it's just on the border with Alsace-Lorraine. So the idea is to march in through Belgium and to quickly capitulate France, then they can turn their focus east to Russia and defeat um, the Russians that way. Now the Russians, they think it'll take them a lot longer to mobilize. It doesn't. So you can see here that Russia already has, a, has an army of 1 million, which is really impressive that these numbers are going to be flowing and that's, that's super impressive that all the research went into this. Um, Germany with 800,000 on the Eastern Front, 2.4 million on the Western Front and 2.5 million for the French with 500,000 Austro-Hungarians against 358,000 Serbians. Now, very important to note, to note, that's a new word, to note is that Serbia was involved in the Balkan War. And so a lot of this, um, there was a lot of troops that actually had experience, generals that had experience, though Serbia really was grinded down through these conflicts. So that's the, uh, that's the, what would you say, the opening stages, if you will. Let's keep going from here. Point. So it looks like there's no text. There's no text here. The Christopher video had text. So. so you can see here that they're actually crashing through Belgium quite quickly. Um, and this was probably the 
point of the war in which the most territory was moving because the, the trench warfare had not set back yet. But you can see the French are actually pushing back. At this point, the British have a small expeditionary force. I believe it's in the north of Belgium. I might be wrong on that, but they're definitely in Belgium. And British involvement would become more and more during the war. Um, so they're, they're sort of along here and they have a smaller expeditionary force that would become more important. And there's a lot of movement here on the Eastern Front. You can see that uh, Germany is actually pushing back Russia already. And Serbia here is actually pushing into Austria-Hungary. Uh, Austria so kind of embarrassing here for Austria-Hungary uh, being, you know, kind of set back already by the smaller nation of Serbia. So here on the west, we can see, yep, yeah, so you can see here um, on the west, this front line is solidified and there is a race now to the sea. There's a race to uh, to capture these ports here in Belgium and you'll see who, who eventually wins on that one. The eastern front is solidifying somewhat, though there will be more movement in the eastern front than the western and Serbia still, um, yeah, doing quite a good job against fighting against an empire. Yep. See the race there in the west. And geez, just look at the numbers already. So the Ottomans join. Um, the Ottomans being the sick man of Europe at this point, smelling opportunity and facing Russia for the fifty-fourth time. <laughs> at this point, I went into that during my uh, Russia country series, where yeah, the Ottomans and the Russians fight a lot to say the least. And so the, obviously this is more preoccupied for their front. I mean, the Ottomans would arguably be the least successful of the central powers here versus the Entente, which is the blue, or just the allies, if you will. So you can see Russia's actually pushing back here. They have now double the strength of Germany. Look at the dwarfing here though, 3.2 million versus 2.1 million. Whereas you have 1.1 million here and double your numbers here as well. So the Russians would take a ton of casualties on the Eastern Front. Germany would as well, but not to the same level as Russia. Serbia pushing back here in the south. Very impressive. And the West is basically completely solidified. This will not change much until around 1917, 1918. Some, some movement here on the east. I mean, just look at these numbers. I just, the, the millions of men that are right now fighting on the battlefields. And what's interesting is that despite the casualties, it's still going up. From the grass and pension, long deserved and long deserved. Ah, so here's Gallipoli, a uh, very famous, <laughs> what would you call it, blunder, if you will. Um, I don't know too much about it specifically, but I know it's one of the things that made Winston Churchill famous. It was a massive mistake. It was basically a naval invasion to try and take these islands by the Brits, and it was a huge failure. Some pushback there on the eastern front. All right, you can see this is the most active front. Italy has now joined the war. So Italy um, originally was actually in a um, in an alliance with the Central Powers. However, they had a defensive pact. So while Germany basically signed off, that's why it's called the blank check and not you know the, the defense pact or whatever, is because Austria-Hungary was in an offensive war. Italy was not obliged to join. So eventually, them trying to suss out which can be the best opportunity for them. Um, and trying to get more territory, so specifically, um, so South Tyrol here, and then this part as well in the Balkans. Sorry, I'm not. I'm going to mess up the region name, so I'm not going to say it. Um, so they want to really unify Italy. So a lot of uh, sometimes World War One is sort of considered, I believe, the fourth Italian um, re reunification war, if you will, because they're just trying to really grab territory here at expense of Austria-Hungary. And I said, um, well. I've already recorded that video, but it'll be coming out later. But in my opinion, the Austro-Hungarian army and the Italian army at this front 
It's one of the worst ones to be in, in my opinion. All right, see the Western Front hasn't moved, hasn't moved at all. Whereas the Eastern Front, you can see Germany starting to make waves. Serbia, Serbia one year on, still holding out. Incredibly impressive. Right, the, the Russians pushing through in the south here, the Ottomans pushing them back. And it's unfortunate too, because there's a lot of combat going on in, in Africa that we just can't see here. And it was the same thing in the World War II video, though a lot of it did take place in um, North Africa where we could actually see. All right, so the Italian front as well, this is stalled. On the Isona River, I believe. Look at that push. Yeah, and, even, and this is even despite the fact that it's 2 million men now on the Eastern Front compared to 3.3 for the Russians, and still Germany is making that large push. I'm actually not too sure what's going on here. That's actually something I'm not sure about. So, oh, geez, I lost my eye there. Wow, okay, hello. Uh, <laughs> I almost missed that. So the reason that Serbia um, has now unfortunately practically fallen is because Bulgaria enters the war. Bulgaria is also at this point very diplomatically isolated. They just lost um, the second Balkan war. I believe that took place in 1912, if I remember correctly. Um, and they're also looking to, to take back territory, right? And so they see opportunity here. And eventually German troops are actually pushing on this line as well with Austro-Hungarian troops. This has become a massive issue because it's one front that now the Austro-Hungarians um, are still dealing with, despite the fact that Serbia is a smaller country. So eventually Serbia is invaded by the Germans, the Austro-Hungarians and the Bulgarians, uh, which leads to their defeat. They also do um, just some treacherous marches here through Albania. Um, and I talked about that a little bit more as well in the World War One videos by Epic History TV. And Bulgaria was incredibly effective uh, Central Powers partner. That's not talked about a lot. So Serbia is now practically defeated. Uh, there's now some fighting in Greece. Greece will enter the war quite soon. So it seems to be some pushes down here. Again, I'm not too familiar with this with this part, so. Still, 3.7 million. All right, the Western Front, the Allies, they now have more numbers than the Central Powers. 1916 now. And what's fascinating too is like, again, this front hasn't moved, has not moved. There were 12 assaults on the Izona. I'm sorry if I'm screwing that up. Izana River um, that the Italians tried to take against um, Austria-Hungary and the chief of staff Luigi Luigi Cadorna, um, one of the more inflexible tacticians of his time, just kept ordering these assaults at mass casualties and seemingly didn't care for the effectiveness of uh, of, of his planning. <laughs> Three point nine million in the Eastern Front now. Phew. Russians starting to push back a little bit. So Romania will be joining as well soon. I believe that was 1917. Right, so the Russians are starting to push through into Turkey, or modern Turkey. Four million now in the Eastern Front, crazy. That's Bulgaria pushing now. So Romania enters the war. Romania again seeing the opportunity here and trying to pick which side to join on. They were trying to play both sides. They were also selling a ton of oil to Germany as well at this point. And Romania uh, decides to join 
the Entente, thinking that they can quickly push through, gain territory at expense of Bulgaria and Austro-Hungary. So this is uh, sort of, this would, Greater Romania, if you will, All right? This Transylvanian area, which was, um, what would you say, disputed between Romania and Hungary. And so they try and join opportunistically, but as you'll see quite soon, yeah, it wasn't quite, well, in the long term, it was the right side, but in the short term, certainly not. And again, Western Front hasn't moved, Italian Front has not moved. You can see Germany pushing back, Bulgaria. Now they're in Romania proper. Yeah, Bulgaria being extra effective. Closing in on Bucharest. Look at those encirclements. Yep, Bucharest is now taken. And Romania has now, within a few months, so I believe they joined about four months ago or so, um, within a few months has lost the majority of her territory. And so though they don't capitulate in the technical sense, um, yeah, they, they've lost. So 1917, the year the United States will join. It's four million now, four million Russians. But it's going down. Okay, there's, there's some pushes from Persia here. Wow. Closing in on the Ottomans. Southern Balkans taken. See, and what's so interesting too is, you look at the numbers here, 3.2 million versus 1.7 million but it isn't just a numbers game. What's super interesting too is that the UK and France only have the Western front to worry about and somewhat the Italian front, and yet their numbers are staying consistent and they just have not moved, has not moved this front at all. Though eventually, due to some Austro-Hungarian assaults um, on the Italian front, they'll have to move divisions down and a lot of British divisions uh, get sent down to the Italian front too. On June 5th, 1917, 10 million men got in line. And every American between the yep. ages of 21... So now, the, as the broadcaster is saying, now the Americans are now officially in the war, June 5th. Um, however, it would take them a long time to actually start serving. Well, there were Americans that were in Europe serving, volunteers and whatnot. I believe there was, a, there was an Air Force unit that was in Britain as well, if I remember correctly. Um, but the American army itself would not be in Europe for at least another six months. And a lot of the fighting that they do takes place in 1918, and the really heavy fighting with a lot of the sustained casualties are in the final months of the war. One and 30 registered for the first U.S. draft since the Civil War. Right. The casualties that Russia's taking right now. Baker pulled a number from a goldfish bowl and the great draft lottery was on. Oh, sorry, Greece, Greece has joined the war as well. Um, so I believe, if I remember correctly, they... they <laughs> booted out for lack of a better word their monarch and will join on the entente side as well again to sort of grab that territory um, that they had lost to the ottomans and to the bulgarians for more than 14 hours straight officials drew numbers to determine the order in which the men were to be called to the color western front still hasn't moved And it's important to note here too, how many casualties are being taken, how many men are being killed. And it's just, it's a shame, really. So some of the expansion here in the, uh, what is modern Estonia. So the Italian front, so this is when, at this point, the British divisions are being rushed down to the Italian front um, and some French divisions as well. So you can see how 
the numbers went down for the Western frontier and they'll eventually be bolstered up here because they were really scared of losing that Italian front, which would have been devastating for the, uh, for the Entente. Okay, I don't know what happened to Crimea there, but... So 1918, the final year of the war here. Germany on its back legs, trying the final offensives. Russia is now out of the war. Practically. Racked by revolution. Yep. Russia would then go on to have the uh, the Russian Revolution, in which the Bolsheviks would come out on top, the Mensheviks initially, but they stayed in the war. The Bolsheviks would then fight the Russian Civil War against the Whites versus the Reds, and would eventually uh, win that war as well. So now, the Germans, they can funnel all their troops west. Though again, there are still obviously a lot of troops there. Yeah. So this is the final, the Kaiserschlacht. As it's called in the West, the final attempts to break the Western Front. Germany at this point is, is practically being starved out by the naval blockade that Britain is doing, uh, that they've been doing since the beginning of the war, and Germany really is militarily on its last legs. And if these pushes don't succeed, which you'll see they don't, that's it for Germany. All right, it's at this point, the Americans are starting to really enter Europe. There's hundreds of, more than 100,000 a month, if I remember correctly, maybe 100,000 a week. Um, tons of Americans are joining, and so the writing really is on the wall. Looks like the Ottomans have pushed through here. Some fighting going on in Persia. Greece is at a standstill. I didn't know that, actually. I thought there was this more active front. Yeah, you can see the pushes here, the final pushes, September now, massive, massive push in Greece, okay, that's what I was waiting for, Bulgaria is now out of the war, defeated, signs an armistice, allowing for the, 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 the Greece frontier to break through, Romania still doing its thing. Right, see this final pushes the Western Front in October, and it's, yeah, Austro-Hungary basically tearing at the seams as a, as a country. They would not last past this point. Um, Austria-Hungary will be broken up, and I'll show you a map of, of what actually would happen. Austria-Hungary is out. The war is over. On 11-11-1918 at the 11th hour, the 11th day, the armistice, well, sorry. The armistice was previously signed, but the guns fell silent. So, I hope that, so this looks like it's just going to instantly end. <laughs> so, so by the end, having a look at the numbers, we have around half a million troops on the Italian front, 1.4 million uh, on the French, on the France, on the Western front, with uh, obviously France and Britain, and of course our allies too: Canada, New Zealand, Australia, India, very, uh, South Africa. It's important to remember the Commonwealth countries here. And so what would happen, you might be asking? Well, grab this, that's my sister made. And uh, what would happen is that da, 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 the Austro-Hungarian Empire would be split into Czechoslovakia, Austria, Hungary, the Kingdom of Yugoslavia. Romania would gain all this territory here from the Austro-Hungarians. Bulgaria would actually lose uh, this piece of territory to Greece. Uh, Turkey would then go through its own uh, civil war afterwards as well and be established as a modern state. Poland would come into existence, uh, well, again, for the I don't know how many times, um, and then the Baltic states as well. So uh, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, as well as Finland would get her independence and would go on to fight a civil war as well. So this uh, would be the map. This is the 1936 map, um, but this is what eventually would happen to Europe, whereas before... It had initially 
I'll just quickly show this here, had started like this, where you can see Germany is much larger and Austro-Hungary -Hung comprises of all these nations. So thank you very much for joining. Hope you found that informative. Hope you found that fun. Um, that was basically all of World War I in one video. There were a couple of missing things here. Like I said, there was no Africa front and you can't really see too much of the Middle East, but either way, let me know in the comment section below if you enjoyed it. Take care, all the best. Thank you very much for joining me. See you guys in the next video.